Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Awesome. I'm really excited that we are starting into 1 Corinthians. We're going to work through 1 Corinthians right from start to finish. It's going to take a while, um, probably the better part of a year. Um, I, I might be able to condense it down and, and, and deal with some bigger sections and things like that, but there's some pretty huge issues that we're going to deal with uh, in this book. The one preface that I want to give you right at the very beginning is, first of all, when you're studying any of Paul's epistles, what you need to understand is, is Paul is, first of all, seeking the will of God in everything that he's doing, and second of all, Paul is writing what often seems like correction to his churches, and it is correction, but he does it in, in, in love, he does it in faith, he does it in hope. And so 1 Corinthians, a lot of people look at it like it's Paul pulling out a whip and, and telling them what to do, that they shouldn't do this and they shouldn't do this and you can't do this and you can't do that and you should do this and should do this, but that's not Paul's intention at all. As a matter of fact, Paul is reacting to a letter that the Corinthian church sent to him. You'll quite often see in, in the, the book of 1 Corinthians where he replies that he's where he states that he's replying to their letter. In regards to this, here's the answer. So what we have happening is, is a church that's trying to figure out stuff in a, a messy, 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 messy town. The, the church of Corinth, Corinth it had actually 250,000 people, free people, living in it at the time, and roughly 400,000 slaves. So there's a lot of people living there, but there's 250,000 free people, 400,000 slaves. So probably everybody had a slave or two uh, of, of their choice. The, the goddess Aphrodite had a temple. She was the main temple. The main temple was the temple of Aphrodite, and that was a very sexual, immoral place, basically. It was a temple full of massive orgies constantly, people having sex, people moaning. They actually said that you could hear moans and weird noises coming from the temple. And, and actually, one of the corrections that Paul gives is actually about some of the spiritual giftings. And the problem that's happened is, is they're hearing similar noises coming out of the church, and they're comparing it to the temple. So that's what Paul's actually dealing with. And we're going to deal with a lot of that culture and a lot of the things that surround it, why Paul's writing the things he's writing. But the coolest part about Corinthians is the simple fact that a church exists there at all. Because this town, honestly, to put it in contemporary terms, would make L.A. look really tame. Make New York look like a loving place. Okay, like it is bad. You want to talk about you want to talk about just weird, weird, dark, demonic, horrible things going on. Corinth was the place, but Corinth was also one of the richest cities in this time. It was it was actually right on, on the water. It had several different ports attached to it. It was a lot of trade and a lot of wheeling and dealing, a lot of money being made in the town of Corinth. And it's interesting how all of that is all tied in together, and that is dealt with a little bit in this book. But it's a miracle in itself that a church even exists. Paul, on a second missionary journey, goes to Corinth and plants a church. By preaching the gospel, people hear the gospel, right? We know the formula to how uh, Paul describes it, that the gospel is preached, people hear, and they respond to the gospel. This happened in a town that is full of nothing but making money and having sex, which I mean, a lot of people's opinions would be the two greatest things in the world, right? Making money and having sex. This is good times. Oh, come on. That's good. <laughs> a few of us are like, yeah. <laughs> Let me read the intro to this book, and then we're going to pull up a few things out of this, and then we're going to turn over to Chris. It says, Paul, called by the will of God to be an apostle of Christ Jesus and our brother Sosthenes. Now, first of all, when he says, and our brother Sosthenes, what's happening here is Sosthenes is just a, a guy that was actually a part of the Jewish temple there. And he went with Paul. Paul's in Ephesus at the time that he's writing this book. And he, Sosthenes, is actually the scribe that is writing down this letter right now. So Paul's giving credit to where credit's due. He's like, this is from Paul, the apostle, which is a loaded thing in itself, his claim to be to apostleship. But, and also from Sosthenes. Sosthenes is the guy that's writing this down, that's helping me communicate to this to you, and he's also the guy that's going to bring the letter your way. Okay? So, to the church of God that is in Corinth, 
and to those sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints, or the NIV would say called to be holy, together with all those who in every place call upon the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, both their Lord and ours. Grace and peace, sorry, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Right there, he's, he's taking authority. He's got apostleship, and he, that claim is a claim of authority, and then he is giving the authority of grace and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm a messenger. Okay? I give thanks to my God always for you. Wait a minute. This church is probably one of Paul's most disastrous churches. They are a, they are a mess. As we, get, as we go through this book, you're going to see that, that we have one guy who Paul tells them to actually kick out of the church. And the reason they're supposed to kick him out of the church is not because he wasn't a good guy or anything like that, but it's because he's sleeping with his stepmom. Which is kind of creepy, right? And they've, they've attempted, through the process, of trying to reconcile, trying to correct, but not necessarily in the way that we would view this today. See, today, a lot of times if we go to kick somebody out of the church, we do it because they don't agree with us. Or we do it because of every other issue except doctrine or except Christ. So that's not what Paul's dealing with here. He starts this whole thing with this messed up group of people that, had, as far as I'm concerned, would totally bum Paul out. If I had planted a church in Simcoe here, and I had left people in charge of that church plant, and when I left, things were going great, and then I go, and a couple years later, you're an absolute disaster. You're sleeping with your aunts and uncles, and all kinds of craziness is going on. You're using the gifts of the Spirit improperly. There's all kinds of crazy stuff. And I wouldn't start my letter off saying... I give thanks to my God always for you. I'm thankful for you. You guys are awesome. This is wonderful. You're, I pray for you all the time. No, I'd be like, come on. What are you guys doing? But not Paul. This is the cool part about Paul's letter. See, Corinthians, the book of Corinthians is a correcting book, but it is not a negative book. It's actually nothing negative about Paul's writings to the church of Corinthians. But he goes on and he says, I give thanks to my God always for you. Why? Because of the grace of God that was given you in Christ Jesus. What you've got to understand is, is that Paul knows that they're a mess. He understands that they haven't got everything figured out. He understands that they're engulfed in sin. He understands that they're not living the life that they're called to live of saints to be holy. But he also understands that God sees them as saints and as holy. Even though they're all messed up. So he gives thanks to God for them because of the grace that is given to them in Jesus Christ. Paul always focuses on Jesus. Not just Jesus, but Jesus Christ crucified. Which means he focuses specifically on Christ's death and resurrection and what that did for you and I and what that did for this church. And what he's saying is, is what that did was it offered them grace and peace. And he's thankful for them because of the grace that God has given them. In other words, you guys are a disaster and you'll never have it figured out, but God still sees you as holy. God sees you as sanctified. God sees you as perfect because he's looking through the eyes of Jesus at you right now. Anybody here feel perfect? Anybody here act perfect? Is anybody here perfect except Big Dan? Think about this. Paul is going to address a correction letter to a church that is the messiest church I've ever seen in my entire life. It, is, it makes Simcoe look like saints. It is wonderful. Everything is good in Paul's eyes because grace has been given to them. I need you to understand this. If we are going to get deeper into Paul's epistle to the Corinthians, you need to understand that a lot of the things, the preconceived ideas that have been shaped, don't exist in Paul's mind. And they definitely don't exist with God. 
when you respond to the word of God, to the preaching that you hear and you respond, you are now a child of God. 